My name is Yuji Haraguchi. I'm the owner of the fish market Osakana. Today, I'm going to put your whole tuna into the pieces you see at sushi restaurants. First, I'm gonna check the quality of the tuna I received. There are two ways that you can do this. The first one is coring, and then the second one is cutting a sample from the tail. You are trying to see the color of the tail is the same as the middle of the tuna. When we grade, the grading usually starts from number one to three. You're looking for number one. Number one has a bright color, bright bloodline, and then nice fat content. This fish is definitely number one. The important thing about any fish breakdown is sharpening the knives. So I spend a lot of time sharpening. I always try to use different knives for the same part to see which one gives me the best result. If I was to use only one knife to break down the fish, I would choose the Guto, known as the chef knife. For butchering the whole tuna, I'm gonna use these five knives. Yanagi, Miyoroshi Deba, Deba, Guto, and Yodeba. Now I'll start breaking down the fish. I'm taking the colors off first. There are strong scales that is connected to the bottom of the fin that I'm holding. Then from there, I'm just trying to put the knife in between the color and then the top of the belly. So I'm not cutting through the bones. I'm just cutting the meat underneath the color. Fish butcher in general, you're not supposed to hit anything other than the meat. You're just putting the knife right on top of the bone so that you're pretty much just sliding the knife. It is not the power or pressure you need to cut something hard. It is a sharpness and the speed. If you have a sharp knife, you don't need to press hard with the weight, but you just need the speed. There are four different kinds of tunas in general. Albaco tuna, yellowfin tuna, big eye tuna, and then bluefin tuna. This fish is about 100 pound big eye tuna. Most of the time, tuna's head and guts are removed on the boat, so we call it HNG tuna. So 100 pounds HNG tuna, very nice bright red meat. Now I'm gonna remove these really hard scales that are right next to the back fin. It is important to remove those before we fillet it, otherwise the knife wouldn't go through. We use most of the scraps and then we make a really nice ramen called tuna kotsu ramen. Scales are the only thing that we're not able to use, but otherwise the other meats and colors, bones and fins, they are really great for making ramen. I'm going to cut this tuna into a style called gomai oroshi. In Japanese, gomai means five pieces. Two back loins, two bellies, and the bones. Bones are the last primal section. I'm using the deba just to cut through the skin because the skin's much harder. And after that, I'm switching to gyuto, which is much more flexible and a little bit longer. As you go down the flame tuna, it gets thicker so that you have to adjust your knife. I'm pressing a little bit down into the bone at an angle that doesn't penetrate the bone. It's almost close to a parallel, it just sits on it. So that you're not gonna have so much meat left over or cut through the other side of the fish. So now, I just switched to a smaller yo deba, and I'm trying to separate the back from the belly by just opening up the skin. Yo deba is the double edge knife, but it has the same sharpness as the deba knife, which is the single edge knife. But when I cut things straight down, double edge knife actually works better, because the single edge knife goes a little bit deeper in. Now I switch to the gyuto knife, which is much larger, flexible, and thinner so I can feel the bones better. So these bones right here are unique to the bonitos and tuna. Other fish do not have strong bones right here. That's just the way fish body is structured. Here I'm gonna remove one of the loins by cutting the neck bones, and then the rest is all separated. So as soon as I cut the neck bones off, the whole piece of the meat will come off. Now I'm gonna remove the thicker loin, which is the belly loin. So the belly fin, known as the harahire in Japanese, is actually very underutilized in cooking. A lot of restaurants actually don't use it. When I was working for fish companies, I just realized so many belly fins were being discarded, and I started making a broth. It had a really nice collagen, so I saved it. 
It was really delicious. I'm going to do the same process as with the buckling. The first thing is always to cut the skin to make an entrance for the gyuto. The belly is much hotter because it has a strong ribs attached to it. The back loin is much easier because if you do it right, the meat will come off very easily. But a belly loin, it's hard to see the shape of the ribs because it's covered with the skin of the stomach, like you see here. I always tell people, it's important to cut what you see. That's why I cut at eye level, and the knife should always be close to eye level, instead of guessing. I'm cutting the strong bones that separates the back and the belly. You could cut the bones that I'm cutting right now from the other side, but it's really hard to see because of the meat that's in front of you. So I'm trying to make it easy by just looking at it and then cutting it. That's why I turn the fish over one time. This piece will come off with the bone still attached, and it's much easier to take the bone off once it's on the cutting board. I'm gonna come back later to remove the bones attached to the bloodline and then also the ribs attached to the belly. Now, I'm going to do the exactly same cutting process again, but from the bottom. Some people put the bones the other way, but I personally prefer it this way, because I can see where my knife is through the bone. The result is always better, because you know exactly how your knife is performing. I'm just cutting the meat underneath the bone. This way, it's much easier because I can have really good control of where my knife is. And then I can have my left hand to hold it, so the grip is much better. Here, I'm going to start peeling the sinews that are connected to each marrow in the spine. I'm gonna use my deva to cut the sinews, then lift the bones as I move forward to the head. Tuna bones are very easy to break because they are not all connected. Each bone, they are connected with almost like a film or skin that has a collagen in it. So that's easy to tear. Last part I'm cutting is the neck and also the top of the rib, which is very hard. So I'm using my deva to chop through the bones. Later, I'm gonna come back and then scrape all the meat left on the bone. Here, I just separated the back loin and the belly loin. The bones that are between the bloodline, I just put my knife right next to it, then just cut straight down. Now, gomai oroshi is finished. This is the breakdown of the tuna. I have four loins, two back loins, two bellies, and one set of bones. You also have one belly fin and two collars. Now, I'm going to break down one belly loin into saku blocks. I'm now removing the ribs from the belly. This is much easier to do once the loin is on the cutting board, like this. I'm just putting my knife right next to the bones, so that there's a less waste with the meat. And just cutting straight down. And then I separate the skin, almost like a sheet of the bone is removed. This is just the neck part that's part of the bone that I was removing. Just removing one big piece of bone. Now I'm skimming the ribs and then the skin of the stomach and trying to separate them from the belly loin. Trying to leave as little meat as possible on the ribs so nothing is wasted. Cutting a whole fish makes you feel that it's taking a long time. But it is important to take your time and do one bone, one sinew and one muscle at a time. You have to be very careful you're not gonna penetrate the meat that you're not supposed to. And also you're keeping the cutting board and environment very clean. Now I'm removing the belly known as the zabuton. Zabuton is usually the fattiest part of the tuna. That is where we get chutoro and then the toro. The rest of the meat is known as akami. Now I'm making what we call koro. Koro means blocks. I'm trying to have the same length of the blocks. I just use my hand as a measurement instead of using the scale. There is no rule. Some people make the sake blocks very small depending on their refrigerations. Some people make it very long. It's really up to the chef how they want to utilize the sake. But the very important thing is to cut it very evenly. Next step is gonna be removing the skin off the loin. 
I switch to my Mioroshi Deva knife. Mioroshi Deva knife has a very fine edge and it makes it very easy to do fine work compared to the Deva knife or Gyuto knife. It's almost like a Yanagi, but you have more control. Fish scales, if they are very small, you can deep fry them and eat them. We oftentimes fry scales from the Tao fish, which is very common in Japan. But a fish like tuna,、uh, scale is much larger and it's so hard to use. Unfortunately, we have to discard this. Now, skins are off, so I'm going to remove the bloodline. The bloodline is where the blood runs, and the color is much darker and very distinct from the rest of the akami. And then it's one type of muscle. So, if you put a knife in between the regular meat, akami, and then the bloodline, it actually comes off very easily. When it's smaller fish, you can eat the bloodline in sashimi, but when it's larger fish like tuna, it's better cooked. There's actually a lot of iron in the bloodline. So, it has a really good flavor when it's cooked. But it's very rare to see bloodline as part of the menu at the restaurants. But we use it for our ramen dish known as spicy tuna mazeme. We actually c o n f i t with the other scraps that we get from the tuna. It's really good. Now that we're done with making color blocks, we're gonna turn them into sack blocks. First, I square them off. Then, look how thick the meat is. And then, see how many layers I should be making. From one sake block, I always try to make 10 to 15 slices. That's usually good for one person or possibly two people. Since we are a retail shop, I'm just trying to make sake blocks that are convenient size for customers to purchase. I could make sake blocks bigger or smaller, but this size I'm doing is a good size for our customers. When I look at grains and colors, If there is some parts that are broken or something not good for saku blocks, I try to put them into different groups so that I can utilize all of them. All these cuts are good for sashimi. If it's not good for sashimi, I would scrape them. It's a matter of muscles at this point because the skin and the blood lines are all removed. Tuna has a lot of muscles, so they need to swim in order to breathe. They keep swimming even after they are caught. If that happens, the temperature of the tuna heats up so fast, then tuna actually can cook themselves from inside. It's called yake in Japanese. Yake means burn. Yake is something we look for when coring. It's very important that tuna, after they're caught, they have to be killed right away without any struggle, and then they have to be iced down. When yake happens, it looks like canned tuna, very white. I should say tuna is the most important fish for sushi. It's very rare to see a sushi restaurant that doesn't serve tuna. The funny thing is that Americans go for fatty part of the tuna, whereas the Japanese people go more for red, lean, clean flavor of the tuna. Akami is the leanest part of the tuna, very bright red colors, has more flavor. Chutoro is medium fatty. And Toro is a very oily part of the tuna. It's almost like ribeye is o Toro, sirloin is c h u t o r o and then top round is akami. They're all connected. This Yanagi knife is very special because of its shape. The shape is very long and very narrow, which makes it much easier to slice very precisely. I normally use it for slicing sashimi. But since it's narrow and it has less surface contact, it's actually easier to make this block that I'm making compared to using Mioroshi Deba or Gyuto that I was using before. The tail part has more sinews, so it's gonna be harder to make more saku blocks because you have to remove a lot of tendons and sinews. We use a lot of tail parts to be scraped so that we're not gonna waste any meat. And then, the more you go toward the head, you have more use for sake blocks. This is the belly known as Zabuton that I removed from the belly loin previously. I'm gonna make this into sake blocks as well. Zabuton is usually Otoro. Otoro usually comes from the bluefin tuna, which is just the larger version of the big eye tuna. We didn't have an Otoro in this, as it was smaller, big eye tuna. The sustainability that I believe in is utilizing everything. My personal view is less about what is okay to catch, what is not okay to catch, because I just realized in 
general seafood distribution has so much waste. That is why I started doing business to showcase so many dishes, so many foods that can be made out of the parts that people are usually throwing away. So I tried to use all of the fish. Especially with the tuna, 40% of the weight are considered garbage because those are bones and colors. We are buying what other people call trash to make ramen and to make other dishes. It's so much about how to be creative with what you get. If everybody practices this philosophy, which we call the mottainai or no waste cuisine, you're gonna catch every fish less. That's the kind of sustainability that we are trying to promote. Here is a breakdown of the belly line. Now, I'm going to make them into different types of sashimi. Sushi is vinegar rice with raw fish usually on top. Then sashimi usually means just a slice of raw fish. The main tip here is sharpening your knives. You always want to make sure you have a really good sharp knife and know how you move your knife. You want to utilize the entire stroke. So you're not pressing down, you're actually using the weight of the knife and then you're pulling towards you so that you're just slicing without any force. The thickness should be, when it's tuna, it can be a little bit thicker. When it's other white fish, the thickness should be a little bit on thinner side because smaller white fish have a little bit stronger muscle compared to the bigger fish. So the texture will be chewy if it's cut thick. Also, you should always cut against the grain. So when you eat it, it's not too chewy or too sinewy. And then it actually breaks down much easier. I'm scraping meat off the tail part of the tuna. It has so much more muscle that you can't eat as sashimi otherwise. You can see this preparation in tekamaki, you see in temaki. In the US, a lot of people use this for a spicy tuna with different sauce mixed into it. This is very modern idea of Japanese cuisine. Lastly, I'm going to show how to enjoy the belly by torching. You get completely different flavor and texture when you torch. A mixture of salt and pepper is ready to eat. I personally think when meat is oily, it's better to be cooked. It sort of brings out of the fattiness. So when I'm torching, I'm just looking for char and then fat that actually rises. It has a nice smoky flavor which I think tastes better. When it's done, it's called aburi. Here you see the selection of all kinds of sashimi from one belly loin. Normally, we would repeat the same process for the other three loins that are left. But that would be boring for you guys to keep watching. So I'm gonna move on to the bones. The bones are usually used for our broth. It's really great to add into the stock because of its natural collagen and flavor. But before we do that, we actually scrape off all the meats. We call it nakaochi. Nakaochi means the meat between the ribs. I use a spoon to carefully remove all the meats before I roast them to make ramen broth. We combine nakaochi and the bloodline together and then we actually confit it. Then make a topping for our tuna donburi or our tuna spicy ramen. Also, there's a lot of meat left on the colors too. So before I make them into a stock, I'm gonna try to take as much meat as possible. So after all the nakaochi is removed, I'm going to combine the bones, all of them, roast them nicely, just the surface. Not too much inside and make a really good ramen broth. It's important to cut the bones into smaller pieces so it cooks much faster and then saves a lot of space too. In the kitchen, scissors are something that we use all the time. All the bones except for the spines and then the ribs are very easy to be cut with kitchen scissors. It's actually safer than trying to cut the bones with a knife. Now I'm going to break the spine. The spine is not all one big piece. There's a lot of separation between the bones which is filled with gelatin. So you just find the space where the gelatin is and then put your knife in between them and then splits very easily. It's important to blanch the bones or roast the bones before you make into stock. Just in order to make the flavor more mild overall. Bone marrow is really important for making rich, creamy ramen broth. 
So when we roast it, we make sure we're only roasting the surface, not cook through the marrow. By separating the marrows, it dissolves into the stock much, much easier. Then while we're boiling the stock, it releases all the gelatin and then the fat off into the stock. So when we roast the bones, we make sure that the ovens are like 500 Fahrenheit. And then we roast about 7 to 10 minutes. From there, bones are gonna go straight to the water. Finally, these are all the cuts you get from the whole big eye tuna.